Okay, so welcome to an Evolving Man podcast. Today I'm delighted to be speaking to Simon Partridge. So Simon is a uh, comes from a partly French and post-colonial background in India. His half French grandfather went to Eton. Um, Simon himself was sent to a weekly board in 1954 at age six and to full board from seven to 17. Uh, he was sent to his father's public school, Eastbourne College, in 1960, where he failed to follow in his footsteps. Apart from a short time at the doomed Greater London, London Council, developing community radio, he has been an itinerant uh, writer researcher covering devolved politics, the British Irish conflict, ethno cultural mingling across the islands of Britain and Ireland. The Psychoneurobiological Consequences of Detached Upper Class Child Rearing and Boarding Schools and Intergenerational War Trauma. And more latterly, Complex PTSD and Adverse Childhood Experiences, ACEs. He is a founding director of the London ACEs Hub. He continues to explore and write from lived experience about the linkage between early attachment deficit and ACEs. So welcome, Simon. Thank you for inviting me to your interesting series, Beard. Mm, a pleasure, a pleasure. So we did actually begin this podcast last week, but uh, I had an electricity cut, so <laughs> we didn't yeah. continue. So we had a kind of a, um, a dry run last week. Essentially, I met Simon a couple of years ago on a boarding school conference, boarding school survivors conference, and I've read some of his articles, some of his uh, published um, papers and some different journals. And I just was fascinated by some of his ideas about this uh, boarding school syndrome and upper class complex trauma condition um, and especially complex PTSD. So I thought, yeah, it'd be really great to speak to you today about those things. So what I'd love to begin with is just I'd love for you to share a little bit about your own boarding school experience um, and your own healing journey, really, um, how that looked like. Right. Um, well, you've given a little bit of information in, 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 in the bio. Is um, I was sent to weekly board at six. Um, and I think it's only quite recently I thought, why on earth did that happen? Um, and um, I think probably it was my mother because she came from this um, Indian colonial family and her parents had spent most of the year in India, you know, and she was looked after by grandparents and uh, nannies and nurses. And um, I think she probably went off to boarding school at six. So it was just sort of um, in the family tradition and a uh, sort of slightly more benign interpretation is to think that um, was she trying to break me in a bit gently to going to, to full boarding seven. I mean, you know, but I, I, I certainly don't have any um, personal knowledge of, of, of what was what was motivating her. I suppose one of the things that most, most sort of boarding school survivors uh, realise is that questions only come much later, you know, so one's kind of reconstructing the past from fairly flimsy evidence usually I mean some people are, are lucky and manage to sort of go back over it but um, I think that's quite rare in a way um, so uh, and then I went I, I, I was at um, prep school in Sussex and um, from uh, 1955 to 1960 um, and my, my father's small farm which he bought after the war was literally over the next hill you know, I could almost see it quite um which was a pretty strange experience in some ways um and um i mean i th i think i kind of fitted into the school quite well i mean i somewhat to my embarrassment i found some evidence you know a long time after i left and i'd been back to visit the school after i'd left you know and I, I wouldn't have done that if it had been a, a you know subjectively a terrible experience mm -hmm. um so uh I think I kind of made a made a sort of um, look. I was I was unhappy about going going off. Um, I was homesick for a bit. 
Um, I can remember other boys being more homesick. Um, I think uh, probably what was damaging in a sort of very insidious way was a kind of sort of um, sort of sleazy homoerotic atmosphere in the school. There was there was one master who was known, you know, to put his hand down your trousers if you weren't very careful. Mm -hmm. It was it was almost kind of normalised, you know. Mm -hmm. And the two um, uh, deputy heads were were, were a gay couple. Um, mm -hmm. I have no evidence they, they they misbehave with the boys. Although I did I did meet up with somebody afterwards a long time later, who, who sort of confirmed uh, some rather dubious stuff went on. Mm. Um, but it was kind of not a very nice atmosphere to be in. Um, I think it was one more of neglect than outright abuse, um, except for my incident with the um, school doctor um, during the anal examination the matron went out of the room to get him a glove by the time she came back he'd already you know um put his finger up my anus uh i didn't really know what was going on you know it wasn't until i went to a boarding school survivors workshop um 60 years later that i really caught up with and one of the one of the uh, participants who'd been to a, a catholic boys boarding school you know but they'd been serial raped by monks Said, hang on, Simon. You know, I don't think you're taking this seriously enough. You know, mm. then as happens, these things kind of come back to you from a different angle. And what I recall was the was the surprised look on the matron's face when she came back into the room. I mean, I definitely remember the incident. You know, it, mm. it stuck in my mind. Um, so it was, uh, you know, pretty pretty nasty thing to happen. Um, mm. uh, and. In a way, I sort of see it now as kind of um, sort of indicative of the neglect one experienced in, in, in those sorts of situations. Um, so, um, you know, from there, I, I I think I always felt rather estranged from school. You know, I, I was there, but not there in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I think my heart was still on the farm, you know, my father's farm. And the thing I really enjoyed, I remember, was um, the previous pandemic the Asian flu of 1957, and the yeah. school was closed. Um, you know, apparently everybody went down with the flu. And I went back to the farm for five or six weeks. And actually I kind of, you know, did some farming with my dad and took the milk churns up the hill in the morning and watched him milk the cows, you know, fabulous. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, but, but, but so exceptional. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's mm -hmm. in a way what I feel in retrospect, I, I, was, I was denied, you know, that kind of that kind of contact. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it, it's um, yeah. Why did it happen? I mean, you know, that that's the kind of um, almost unanswerable question in a way. But um, it wasn't good. And then I I, I did take the eleven plus. Mm. I passed the eleven plus. I could have gone to um, grammar school in Lewis. But I, I didn't know what a grammar school was. I had I had no idea, you know, what the choice was really. Mm -hmm. And I think all this all this nonsense about choice, you know, of of, of kids under I don't know when when does when, when does one have enough knowledge to make a choice? Certainly not at um, you know eleven or twelve. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, um, I, I I just sort of trundled down the kind of um, the, um, this is the way we do it line, you know. My mm -hmm. father had been to Eastbourne College, um, had, had done very well there. In fact, it was only really last summer that when I was writing the, the paper about the upper, com upper class complex trauma condition, mm -hmm. I suddenly sort of saw, saw my father as, as, you know, a really successful product. Boarding school, he was the first generation boarder, and um, it turned him into... Um, Fleet Air Arm Officer, you know, Royal Marine. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought, uh, in a sense, um, he lost a lot in the process, you know. He knew nothing about his own background. Um, didn't even know his, his, his family had been tenant farmers. I mean, that, that struck me as absolutely extraordinary. Wow. I only discovered it after his death, you know. So <laughs> maybe there was some subconscious knowledge in the family, but it, it couldn't be articulated. And it was exactly the same with my mother. Um, she had no knowledge of, of, of the family's Indian in, in, uh, inheritance, you know. Mm. Um, and it was only only during lockdown last summer 
that I started to really get to grips with this. And I've discovered from a DNA analysis, I have a small percentage of South Asian genes, you know, and I, and oh. I think I've discovered the person who it comes from. Wow. So, um, you know, I come from a family, appears in which I feel the sort of um, family history has almost been obliterated. Mm -hmm. One of the agents of the obliteration is undoubtedly boarding school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. So at what point did you kind of start to wake up to this fact that, you know, my family history had been obliterated by boarding school or even this idea of boarding school syndrome, that there was a thing there that, oh. I think the obliteration is a really quite recent, recent okay. sort of recognition. Um, boarding school syndrome, um, I came across that, um, I think, in a kind of conscious way um, or, or it's sort of I'd, I'd, had, I'd had for quite a long time sort of intellectual idea that boarding school doesn't do you much good mm, 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 mm. but I didn't really connect it you know at the deeply emotional level mm. um, I think there are a couple of things really which may be um, and you know what I actually when I started thinking I found an article I, I Nick Duffel or about Nick Duffel in the Observer, right. it was five years old. So I, you know, it, it had meant something to me, but you know how, how sometimes the penny drops, it doesn't drop the whole way. Mm -hmm. Sort of, you know, oh, that's interesting. You, yeah. you don't kind of quite connect it to yourself. Um, but my final uh, go at psychoanalysis, um, which was very complicated by my, my, my wife being um, diagnosed with terminal ovarian cancer. Um, sort of pattern emerged that um, my, my analyses seemed to last about six or seven years and that seemed to sort of tie in with the age at which I was sent off to boarding school. So that seemed mm -hmm. to be a kind of pattern. Um, my step-grandson uh, had reached the sort of age I was when I was sent off to, to boarding school. And I had a very close relationship with him because my, my, my wife wasn't well. So I was kind of almost almost a, a combined grandparent a lot of the time, you know, uh, grandma and granddad rolled into one. Um, and in a way, he, he opened my eyes to, to a lot of childhood experiences which had been closed to me. And one of the things I kind of, which came, A, the thought of him being sent away was unbearable, you know, mm -hmm. on, on both sides, there was a sort of, it was a kind of physical intimacy. I, I remember once sort of sitting on the sofa and, and he just came and sort of lay in my, in my arm, you know, and I, it was, it was just sort of, you know, gosh, uh, what a comfortable experience, you know, uh, which seemed so foreign to me. Mm. Um, and, and he was such a little boy, you know, I mean, yeah. he, you know, his vulnerability was absolutely uh, clear. I mean, you know, yeah. it was, it just sort of, and I think then struck, a much much deeper level it wasn't just a sort of oh no uh, boarding schools are bad institutions you know mm -hmm. I, I started to see really how how it had impacted me and how it had cut me off from my um feeling capacity mm -hmm. and then this is maybe is a bit of synchronicity um my wife was actually a psychotherapist and um she subscribed to the uh, british journal of psychotherapy and uh, in the back of the issue was, it was just a lot of little short abstracts referring to other books or articles. And one was referring to Joy Shaverin's paper. Um, the, you know, the, the, I can't remember exactly what it's called. It certainly, certainly mentioned sort of the trauma of the privileged child. It was her, it was mm -hmm. her first one, which was actually oh. published in, in, in the Jungian journal. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was about 100 words long, Piers. Right. I kind of started to read it. And it was a bit like, you know, I was ticking, that sounds familiar, that sounds familiar, that sounds familiar. I suddenly thought, yeah, um, I don't know who this, who this uh, doing in therapist is, but she's hitting a lot of the nails on the head. It's a powerful and, um, extract, yeah. Yeah, and, and um, you know, I think the, the, the internet had got to the stage then when you, when you could sort of research people and follow them up. So I, I kind of fairly quickly tracked down 
boy, you know, I got to know her quite well afterwards. And um, I appear in some of her um, the papers, you know. And um, so um, she said, you know, I think I wanted to go and see her. And she said, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, she, anyway, she lives quite a long way north of London. And um, so um, she said, well, I think, I think your best bet is to get in touch with Nick Buffle. So that was my kind of introduction to Nick. Um, and I wanted to go on um, a workshop fairly quickly, but they were all booked up that year. So I had to wait for the following year. And I suppose really in a way then the doors opened and um, it, it, all, uh, it all started to make a lot of sense. And I, I remember I, I'd also at that time got involved with the Bowlby Centre, um, which promotes attachment oriented psychotherapy mm, mm, um, mm. and um, unlike the um, orthodox psychoanalysts they, they, they sort of welcomed me with with open arms and mm -hmm. by then I'd become a kind of um, sort of proselytizer for boarding school trauma you know mm -hmm. I went along mm -hmm. and was quite vocal and um, one of the people there was a sort of series of breakout workshops at a conference and, and he said well that sounds very interesting simon would you like to write something for our um, <laughs> for our journal about it so i'm i'm sort of eternally grateful to the bobby center for taking me under their wing in a way and um, mm -hmm. i've always seen uh boarding school syndrome in in a sort of a an attachment framework and, and if it's not being mm -hmm. too boastful i think in some ways i, I did influence um, joy chavron in that direction you know so, um, yeah, that, I mean, that's a sort of brief, brief summary, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Sounds fascinating. Sounds fascinating. Um, yeah, I didn't, didn't quite realise. I, I had read Joy's paper. I don't know if I heard about it almost when it came out. The, the idea of, she, she says something about boarding, early boarding is the equivalent of child abuse and I, I remember hearing that and it was like you know that really that had been hit. the 2011 the paper I came across was the 2004 paper I don't know whether you were talking about the 2011 the, paper the 20, 2004 one um, okay yeah I mean it's it sort of disappeared into my history a bit, but um, yeah, yeah so, but that I'm really just... that really that really kind of struck you yeah yeah just and kind of really it's almost like um, those missing bits of the puzzle. Uh, I'm trying to think of the words, but like affirmation that, oh, what I believe is actually true. What I've been through, there's someone who yeah. believes me. Because I feel yeah. that's often something for us as ex-boarders. It's almost like the normalized thing you were talking about. Yeah. Oh, that's just normal. And actually, when you talk to people, they go, no. <laughs> That's not a normal upbringing. <laughs> well, I, I remember one of the things I took away from the um, um, two-weekend workshop was um, the amazing capacity we showed for, for switching. We, we, you know, and um, Carol Honeybell, who is, who is co-leading the workshop with Nick, um, who hasn't got a boarding school background, was, was absolutely brilliant at picking these up. And said, so you've switched off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and we'd internalize this capacity when we got close to a dangerous feeling just to sort of literally flip you know mm. and yeah it's uh it's those sorts of things it's a bit of a kind of um eureka moment when you kind of sort of it suddenly suddenly uh the, the the maybe the idea and the feeling come together and and, and make a lot of sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I guess the first question I really have is I'd love you to just go into a little bit more about this difference between boarding school syndrome and upper class complex trauma condition, or just introduce a little bit what you mean by that. Right. Upper class UCCTC. It, sure. Um, yes. Um, it's quite complicated, Piers, because they obviously overlap. You know, mm -hmm. so I don't really want to set up a complete um, antithesis between the two. Mm -hmm. um, but what what I noticed, started to notice, was firstly regards myself, were certain things I seem to be grappling with 
which weren't covered by purely um, sort of abandonment explanation. In, in, in so far as, you know, um, it didn't all occur for me, although how embarrassing I wrote a paper, which rather implied it did, um, at the point of going, crossing the threshold to boarding school. Mm. Mm. But there were there were things I felt which preceded that, and they were things which really came out of, of a wider upper class culture. If you came from that, that social cultural background, mm. not everybody at boarding school has done, and, and it's something we might discuss a bit later. Mm. Um, you know, as maybe your, regards your own trajectory, or, or and and so that that was something I had started to asked some questions about about um, 10 years ago. Um, and um, I think that what what made me, um, but I think, yes, the, so, so I suppose there was a, there was a bit of unease about feeling that boarding school syndrome as, as kind of explained by, um, well, Joy in a way was the first person to formulate it like that. Or, or, as I have pointed out, she wasn't the first person to formulate it mm. because Charles Brasfield mm. in, in British Columbia was using the concept a long time before that. And as I point out in my paper on the upper class complex trauma condition, he wasn't the first person to use the phrase either. You know, it was actually <laughs> first used by native Aboriginal uh, indigenous uh, Canadian people. Mm. Um, and it was used in a very critical way because they saw it as over psychotherapizing their awful experiences under uh, British colonialism. Um, so um, it, it, it didn't sort of, uh, in, in a way, it with everything I felt I, I was dealing with. And, and because it was focused so um, specifically on the boarding school situation, I think what I felt Initially was yeah it's it's missing what precedes that mm. and it's also missing a bit what comes after it you know yeah. because if you're traveling in a kind of um how can I put this? say a conventional sort of upper class um development mm. um you start off by being born into what is quite a detached family with nannies mm. nurses that's changed a bit but you know it's it's even today, you know, you, you, you're, you're likely to have a nanny or an au pair or mm. possibly one or two other people around the house if you're extremely rich. Before the war, you see, when, when my parents grew up, that, that, was, that was par for the course for anybody who had, had, had some money. Mm. Um, you know, um, servants cost almost nothing. So, you know, it, these people were around. And, and actually, John Bowlby is a classic example. Um, so... Uh, there's, there's a sort of sense in which you you are kind of um, cultured into into a sort of rather detached state of mind, and then you go to boarding school where it's where it's evidently reinforced, and that provides you with a pathway into, if I want to put it very generally, um, uh, positions of power and influence where where emotions aren't necessarily the most useful thing to have. You know, in fact, they might get in the way. Yeah. If you've got to be, you know, um, very tough and say a semi-colonial situation. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I was trying to describe um, a broader condition. Um, and I think towards maybe at the beginning of last, it was maybe at the beginning of last, uh, of 20, where are we, 2020, 2019, 2020. Um, because I, I, I was sort of thinking that, um, I mean, in some ways, it's very difficult to research this stuff, you know. You can't go out and cross-question a whole lot of um, ex-boarders on, on, on a sample which is kind of well-balanced or what have you. Mm -hmm. So I have to admit, in some ways, you know, the Boarding School Survivors um, Facebook page, which is self-selecting, it's not a scientific sample at all. Mm -hmm. I just noticed certain patterns appearing there. And it mm -hmm. seemed to me that people who had really, really suffered, compared to me, being sent off to boarding school, where in actual fact people who'd been sent because their parents had gone overseas, uh, they were new money, you know, um, and, and by the time I went to boarding school, 
money my family had was, was no longer new exactly. Um, so, um, or I think, um, you know, there's, there's some, some people were sent to boarding school because they had a disability, for instance. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's that sort of example, which, which took me along. And, and some of those people were objecting quite strongly to, to the position I was coming from, saying, you know, this is, this is an upper class problem. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. Saying, well, it's not just an upper class problem, you know. I, I still wanted to say, yeah, but there is an upper class problem, you know. Mm-hmm. And so that's really what, um, what, what my uh, conceptualization around upper class complex trauma condition is. And also, um, I mean, this is a sort of strange coincidence, um, I borrowed the idea from a brilliant paper um, which actually examines the, uh, the cultural, um, I mean, it's, it's actually known as cultural genocide, you know, the, the decimation of um, uh, First Nations people in, in Canada by the colonial regime. And um, it, that's where the sort of the subtitle of um, in, in, in a social context framework comes from. And I thought, oh yes, that that's in a way. I'm, I'm. I said, why can't why can't I look at the upper class in that way as well? You know, mm-hmm. that, that they are very formed by their their social context. Um, and so, so in a way, I kind of uh, moved the idea sideways in a sense. And then I started to see, you know, quite a lot of parallels. I mean, you know, it's. I don't know if it. I found it helpful. I don't know how, how helpful other people will find it. It has been accepted for publication in the attachment journal. But, um, you know, when you, when you look at somebody like um, uh, Johnson yeah, or Trump, mm-hmm. those, those products of boarding schools, mm-hmm. they're behaving in pretty peculiar ways. Yeah. Um, and we, we don't have a kind of name for it, you know. So it's sort of, you know, either turned into a bit of a joke or it's, you know, it's a narcissist. I, I think it's something more structured and mm. explicable in a way, but then we have to look at the what's forming this and um, what's what's constrained in that situation. Um, and stiff upper lip has some very serious repercussions in terms of one's uh, capacity to be emotional, to relate, um, be in the presence of, 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 of other people who are, are suffering maybe and, and including including the people um, doing the oppressing you know it's it's a very it's a very strange paradox peers um, mm-hmm. and it's 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 actually very it's, it's not easy to get hold of because um, mm-hmm. um, there's a kind of um, almost a moral revulsion in some ways mm-hmm. uh, feeling empathic towards people who are being oppressive you know mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's a difficult one, and I, I mean, what's in a way the, one of the things which has struck me more recently is is Alex Renton, who you, who you interviewed earlier on for his for his sort of um, uh, you know very very um, uh, revealing book, Stiff Upper Lip, which, mm. which is about his uh, and other people's experience of abuse at boarding schools. His latest book, Bad Legacy, mm. is um, is about um, his family's involvement with slavery in, in the West Indies, mm. and uh, he's he's. Um, I mean, what comes through is, in a way, how the nastiness of the way they made their money somehow got hidden and split off. Mm. Um, and I think, uh, uh, and the book is absolutely, it, it, it's fascinating and horrifying, and, and I, I salute him for sort of uh, going through the family archives. Mm. His grandfather was the archivist for Scotland, so he's got this sort of treasure trove of stuff, you know, which most of us don't have in the attic. Um, I wish I had it for my Indian family, but I don't. So um, it's 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 really, um, I think, extraordinary how the sort of disturbance nastiness of the British upper class gets hidden mm-hmm. and it gets hidden from almost everybody mm-hmm. so uh, you know to that extent I'm, I'm, I'm making some quite substantial claims for my upper class complex trauma condition uh, saying look you know this is this is this is this is happening it's real it's complex uh, it's uh, it has a, 
a, a very negative effect on society at large. But it also has a very negative effect on the people who are, who are trapped in it. In way. Mm -hmm. And how do we open that door, you know, with, without sort of having a name and a way of looking at it? So that, that's a long explanation, which I hope hasn't just uh, obfuscated situation yeah. no i think that's fascinating i really do thank you and i guess as you're speaking and maybe it's some of your papers i've read or maybe some of your comments um, this idea that it seems that people go for boarding school syndrome they go for healing they go and try and sort it out but it sounds like people generally don't know about this upper class complex trauma condition but how do we almost let people know that it's there and how do we bring the healing to the Trumps and the Johnsons? Because as you say in the article you sent through last week to me about just how many people in these powerful positions, the percentage who've been to these institutions and they're the ones in power. They're the ones, the judges who are passing yep. and they're deeply traumatized. It's a, it's a very closed system. Um, and you see, I think one of the things which um, uh, Joy and Nick don't explain is, uh, except by a kind of a sort of rather crude process of denial, in my view, is an actual fact why there are so few boarding school survivors, mm -hmm. you know, self mm -hmm. self identified. Mm -hmm. And you can, I think, um, Alex, Alex uh, Renton actually worked out that, been, you know, I think two or three million people have passed through boarding school in the last 50 years or something. Mm -hmm. well, the number of people who are actually uh, identify themselves as boarding school, school survivors is really very small. Mm -hmm. And you can't really explain that within the parameters of the um, boarding school survivor syndrome. But nonetheless, you know, I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. It does. And it's, it's very, very painful. And there's a real issue to, to try and resolve and heal from. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it doesn't actually cover the great majority of people who pass through the system. And then, as you say, they go on to positions of power and influence in our society. Um, so, uh, yes, and that disaggregation I did between day, day, private day schools and, and private mm. boarding schools, the private um, education policy forum, the, the, the very helpful editor I got in touch with said, oh, I've never thought of that before. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I th I think it's a I think it's a really important distinction to make, mm -hmm. but how to do it in a way which isn't sort of very kind of morally superior and condemnatory, condemnatory you know, that's mm -hmm. or without belittling people who really who really uh, feel they have got boarding school syndrome, you know, because I th mm -hmm. I think they're both real, mm -hmm. and and at some point they overlap in this institution, so that's you know, it's mm -hmm. it's, it's it's I think quite difficult to to. Uh, get one's head round and hold mm, i was talking to thank you simon um talking to one of the ladies i was at school with uh who i met up with a few weeks ago i'd not so seen you, her since you she was to educational school it was it was the girls came in 1982 83 or 84 and i arrived in 86 so they had only been there a couple of years okay but it was uh you know i won't name the name of my school here uh, yet but the um it was the total opposite so if you had money you were shamed because it was more of a charity school yeah she said, well, that way friends, as well. yeah and it was like no i don't have any money if you well, so. look I, th I think that was i mean strangely enough i mean i think that you know i was growing up in the 60s and 70s and almost at that point um working class culture became fashionable in, mm. in, in Britain, mm. and I think for a long time, I w I was I I kept very quiet about my about my upper class provenance. You know, mm. Mm. I think in a way it's only quite recently I've been able to own it in a kind of way which I don't have to either overplay it or underplay it. Mm. It's take me a long time, Piers, to sort of try and get it into some sort of uh, perspective. You know. Yeah. Um, and, and shame is just so powerful, whichever side of it you're on, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe that's something we all share. You know, maybe that that is that is where we have to we could sort of build bridges around that and that very notion, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, shame. Yeah, because I, it's almost like 
in the same way they've done in the aboriginals in the culture in australia and the first nations in canada this armistice almost if there could be an armistice but for you know borders or something like that here where there's not shame but we just come and it's like just share your stories yeah. you know I, I do men's circles and often the greatest healing is the men who've been to boarding school just sharing and he, well, it's more hearing someone else's story going oh, yeah i'm not yeah. alone because it's the first time sometimes we've heard oh i'm not the only one yes i i, I think what what we haven't quite got to maybe we're inching towards i mean hopefully i mean i think we've got to get there is how we resolve, I mean, in a way, what we're talking about is um, interclass shame here, you know. Mm, mm, um, mm. And, um, you know, if, if, if you have the common fact of, you know, having all been at boarding school, that, that at least gives you a baseline. Mm, mm. But what happens when a kind of upper class person meets a working class person, you know? Mm. And there's definitely embarrassment on both sides and difficulty. And... Mm. Um, look how significant. I mean, one of the things I thought recently is, you know, um, in some ways in British culture, accent is more visible than skin colour. Mm, mm, you know, these signals we read and make assumptions about. Um, and uh, we, we, we need to try and find a way to, to, to unpack this. Um, and I, I don't think we've, we've, we've quite reached... Well, the whole colonialist issue, you see, um, mm. that is a really difficult one. And we don't seem to be able... It's almost like we need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission yeah. around these things, you know. Um, Definitely. And in a way, I mean, look, I think, I think the sort of thing you're doing here, the sort of thing you do in your men's groups are sort of maybe micro-examples of mm. how we can open up a space where we can, without without presumptions or judgment, you know, start talking to each other. Um, mm. Mm what Winnicott called a transitional space. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, thank you. Fascinating, I love, <laughs> we could go off down those uh, those tracks. Yeah. I'd love to just kind of go back to some of the questions here. Yeah, sure. Um, and especially around generational trauma. One of the questions I've got from uh, a lady in the boarding school survivors uh, forums, just saying, I'm interested in the generational traumas, generations of generals and admirals, all following in the footsteps steps of those who came before, and how these familial traumas over a long time have influenced their descendants' behaviour. Um, so I guess that question is, yeah, just about generational trauma. Um, is that really a question? How these? Well, I think it's maybe it's generational trauma. Um, focus through a specific institution is, you know, because um, we're talking about generals and such like. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are talking again about the sort of uh, upper class elite usually, mm -hmm. always, but, you know, usually. So um, I think it's how, uh, and some of these institutions are very old, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they, they literally go back to the medieval time, some of them. So, so there is an, they do have an enormous history, uh, which one has to respect to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, and um, then you, you've got a, 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 cult, a familial culture which part, passes it on, which is reinforced by the pedagogy, you know. So, uh, and then also the positions in society, which, which are, are, are well rewarded in terms of respect, are and, and often money as well you know so it, it, it's a it's a it's a coherent system which um can be uh, is sort of mutually reinforcing so in a way it's kind of um it's not surprising but i i think one of the problems um and i think it's i think it's true in my own family um where, where i one of the reasons why I couldn't follow in my father's footsteps um, is the, the wider context has changed a bit. You know, uh, we, we're, we, in some ways, we are all post-imperial. Mm. So my father going off to join the Royal Marines and literally, in the fleet air, and literally see the world um, on an empire uh, on which the sun had not yet set. Mm. But in the 1960s, 
there was a very different sort of cultural revolution coming over the horizon with pirate radio going, you know, we were picking up the school and things and uh, not to mention, you know, hippies. And I mean, I grew my hair long and, uh, you know, I think my father gave up really when the Rolling Stones appeared. <laughs> Just <sort of laughs> um, so, you know, uh, there's, there's, there's been that. Um, and also, I think there is something about the, um, you know, we do, we do need a certain amount of emotional fuel to function on. And I think, I think uh, in my family, we, we ran out of, of um, <clears throat> sort of motivation, partly a, a kind of what, what are we here for? Mm -hmm. I, thought, I mean, one of the reasons I'm interested in, in war trauma is my father had a traumatic war, you know? Right. He, he, I think he was a romantic young man who, who there was no military history in his family. Um, and um, I think he, yeah, he, 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 he was attracted by the glamour of, 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 of um, being um, in the Navy. I don't think he, uh, you know, everybody thought World War I was the war to end all wars, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think he, 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 he didn't think he'd get pitched into um, another war. Um, but he was shot down twice, um, and um, the second time he was sent on a, a revenge raid by the Admiralty, and he thought he thought it was Churchill's personal decision. He hated Churchill. Um, he had no, he had very low opinion of, of monarchy, which is strange when you consider him serving officers. You know, first duty is to, to the monarch. Um, and uh, he wrote a little, he did leave a little memoir behind and um, in which he describes the raid he was sent on as bonkers. And that's a very strong word for somebody who's, who's had the career he had, you know. And I think he's, I think at a certain point he stopped believing in, in, in the kind of um, uh, underlying ideology of, of the ruling elite, you know. Mm. So he... You know, I was sent off to, to, to public school, but not with, you know, this is a great thing you're going to do, you know, you're going to end up doing, uh, serving Queen and country. Um, he used to come and watch, he was a, he was a very good tennis player and captain of the first 15. Um, he did used to come and uh, come down and, and watch the first 15 playing. There was, a, there was a big sort of pitch in front of the main school building. I used to sneak a kind of uh, half an hour with him while he was doing it, you know, but that was, that was about the sum total of his, his, his involvement with my education, you know. So I, th I think for some families, they, they literally, they run out of steam. Um, it becomes so, so closed down, so without motivation, that uh, in a way, uh, end up with complex PTSD. You know, in, in my case, so that, that's what I would call it. And there's other things you can call it. But, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's not a very functional state to be in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. It's interesting how our stories overlap slightly. My father was also an officer in the navy, uh, oh, really? not the Marines, down in Portsmouth. So I was, oh, yes. uh, I grew up next to a, a naval base down in Leon Solent, and. But my father was invalided uh, out of... I think one of my father's fleet arm stations was there. Really? Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I lived right next to the barbed wire fence. Sometimes I see my father through the uh, the mesh, <laughs> the fence. Um, but yeah. he, he was an alcoholic and he was um, uh, invalided out of the Navy. Um, and I read some letters he wrote to the Navy after he, he left. And yeah, he was very unhappy with them um, yeah. because of how they treated him. And, you know, he was ordered onto ship where the doctor said, no, it'd be really bad for you because you're struggling with alcohol. Yeah. Go onto yeah. the ship. Um, but they, it was like, came from on high. No, you have to go. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a very interesting parallel. Did he yeah. go to boarding school? He did. Yeah, 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 yeah. So... <laughs> So I, but, you know, I went to boarding school. I was sent partly, you know, for me, I made that choice, which is hard, as you say, as a 10 year old to go, you know, oh yeah, I want to go, but I wanted to get away from my father because he was, he was home. 
yeah. from um, but very he had a lot of shame that he'd been kicked out of the navy he now had no no income no job no purpose really um so he was very angry so i was like i need to get out of here and so yeah. i was like go to yeah. boarding school um so um yeah yeah so he went to boarding school himself um and so did his sister and um yeah well, we, are, we, we, we are in the um in the territory of uh, intergenerational um problems, aren't we really here? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. With, with, a, with a sort of military, um, you know, overlay. I mean, yeah. I don't think my father ever really flourished after the Second World War. I mean, he went back to flying briefly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, these these things cast a long shadow in a way. They do. And, you know, interesting. I'm, I always felt that my father hated me. He was always really hard on me. And he died, he got mesothelioma, so um, lung cancer, when he was deconstructing some of the ships in Portsmouth. Uh, and I confronted him. The, uh, the asbestos problem. Yeah, asbestosis, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's terrible. So, uh, yeah. Um, so I confronted him and I said, you know, I felt like you've hated me my whole life, Dad. And it was just a couple of days before he died and he burst into tears and he says, my whole life's been a lie, Piers. And it was like, you know, and I think that's the thing is that generational thing. You go to boarding school, very young age, then for 16 going into the military. Yeah. You know, I really yeah. could resonate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's, you know, that's, that's the splitting peers, you know, that's the splitting. And when you start to undo the split, mm -hmm. you know, it, that's, that's when you need holding and help. Mm. So, um, mm. And I think you see, I think the class we're talking about is is very split. So in a way, mm. we have to approach, I think, the kind of wider social therapy. And I don't think I've got this yet myself. Mm. It's become clearer to me, and which is in a way why I use the word condition because I thought it was fairly fairly non-judgmental. I could mm. have put pathology in there. I was, I've been toying with the idea recently of should I should I say pathology? But I think in actual fact that, that would just sort of uh, rub some salt into the wounds, you know. Mm. So mm. It, it's 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 a really well, you know. It's it's I, I don't have to tell you. It, it's 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 a, it's a hard one to handle for mm. for the parents, and it's 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 not at all easy for the for the children either. Um, mm. So we've both been working on it. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, I could. <laughs> talk for ages i better get back to the questions yeah, yeah. so I, I guess they're kind of linked into what we're talking about here and the next question is really is saying i'm interested in knowing about how some of those descendants have changed their views to behaviors e.g taking a different stand as a conscientious objector or otherwise um so this is kind of coming that generational trauma does that make sense how some of these descendants have changed their view yeah um uh, i'm not sure how many have changed to be honest mm. i mean this gets back to the sort of previous comment but um i think a lot of people are still passing through the system the upper class system uh fairly unreflectively and not mm. very changed um i do think that um we as boarding school survivors are potentially in a vanguard of change. Mm. Um, and I think that, um, you know, we all, we all have our own idiosyncratic personal stories about what sort of tipped it. Um, and I've just given you one take on it in terms of my father failing to believe in the system. And I have a feeling in a way he almost sort of licensed my rebelliousness I wonder if that rings a bit of a bell with you. Um, so, but, you know, may, maybe uh, it's, it's, it's a very strange one. You know, I mean, my dad didn't ever really question what I was doing. And I think it was partly because we colluded with each other around some notion of shame and not, and not performing very well. So how could he call me out, you know? Um, 
what made him go off and buy a small farm in the middle of the countryside, you know? Um, he was a bit of a hippie himself in some ways, looking back on it. Yeah. So um, I don't know. It, it, I, I, think, I think how people change can be quite idiosyncratic, but now there's a more formal critique of boarding schools. There's more knowledge of attachment issues. Uh, there's, there's, there's more, more is known about developmental psychology. <clears throat> there's quite a world of literature you can come across. Um, you can look at podcasts like these, you know. So, um, and I think the piece I've had picked up in the newsletter of the um, Private Education Policy Forum is, is a bit of a straw. And I think it is getting out there, you know. And Louis de Benier, his his revelations. So I think it's it's a kind of mixture of um, individual uh, transformation for, mm -hmm. for probably no no real you know pattern to that in a way, and then there's a kind of um, a slow shift in cultural cultural norms you know cultural expectations critique. Um, I mean, look at the whole business around um, softening of football, you know. I mean, actually, maybe, maybe you know, it's very topical to, to look at the way the England team has behaved as a group of men, really, in a way which puts the she puts the Johnson's cabinet to shame. You know, I feel there's mm -hmm. so much more wisdom and knowledge in the England football team <laughs> than there is around the cabinet table. You know? Yeah. So it's it, there are certain parts it hasn't yet reached, years, but I think it's I think it's coming. Yeah. So, uh, you know, how did someone commented on something I'd written recently that they said that um, if you go in to become a clergy, you go into the priesthood, yeah. you have all of these psychometric, psychometric testing to see whether you are um, it's safe for you, whether you're suitable. But they don't have this for the politicians. Is, is this is this the Anglican Church or what? Which church is it? I, I don't know. Someone just made that comment. I think it must be the Anglic Anglican okay. Church. Anglican. Okay, I'm not. I'm not sure whether it's true. Catholics. And it, it, look, um, maybe they're a bit ahead of the curve. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think it's more a kind of sort of. Um, I think it could be more more carried by by by, by, by culture, you know, that, that um, uh, the notion of vulnerability and trauma, and maybe COVID has sort of put this more on the line as well. Mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, and one of the slogans that's come out of Canada is "Children's Lives Matter." You know, there's awful revelations about the um, mm. children who were. Uh, Killed, died, unburied, you know, the, the, the appalling way in which we have actually neglected children. Um, and our culture is, is, is pretty, uh, pr pretty awful at that, you know. Um, but, but these things, I think, are changing. Um, now, I, I think, I think the issue more is what, is what is the pushback going to be from these... Um, rather dissociated people who hold the levers of power and influence. And in a way, you can almost see Johnson grappling, trying to grapple with that at the moment. I mean, he, he made this ridiculous speech yesterday in which he was trying to square a number of possible circles, you know? Um, and uh, I, I'm fascinated, you know, I, 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 think, I think he could, could collapse, you know? Mm. But he himself is a kind of... Um, Facebook example of of these of these uh, inner inner tensions and issues. Mm. Um, unable to maintain a relationship, you know. Um, uh, you you can see him dissociating in front of the um, in front of the interviewer's camera, mm. and I, I'm just waiting for a kind of interviewer who, who has enough um, self possession and knowledge to say, "Could you please look at me while you're while you're answering my questions." Mm. It's, it's very telling, I think. You know, he cannot hold uh, somebody's gaze for more than about 10 seconds. Mm. Yeah. 
It's interesting. I learned that at school as well. I felt so uncomfortable. I couldn't look at anyone. Just you know, shame again, you know, I mean, wherever it came from, you know. Yeah, I think it was my emotions that used to, it's like, oh, no, no, I can't look at anyone. So, yeah, just, well, you're, <laughs> Garen, is, your emotions were real, Piers, but the yeah. institution couldn't, couldn't uh, allow them, you know. I mean, that, that, that's, you know, that's, uh, uh, I, th I think you know we have to we have to work towards a different notion of power. You know, mm. it's not something you do to people; it's something you share. Yeah. You know, in in in, mm. in, a, in a in a collaborative way. Mm. And you know, there's there's. I think we are on the cusp of some big changes, and and as I say, to some to some extent, the boarding school survivors movement is part of the vanguard. Mm. In my in my view. Mm, yeah 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 me too i think it's it's very exciting i was speaking to someone today about you know in my my sister works in um foster caring just just sharing some of you know how that system is totally broken down what's happened during covid and then the education system talking to a teacher today um and then i was sent a a book i think last week about servant leadership the idea that we're there to serve the people, you know, and it's like that's very different from the leadership that we generally see. But yes, but you know, if you if you go back a bit, you know, there was a very um, explicit notion of public service. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot mm -hmm. got lost in the in the sort of Thatcher Reagan neo neoliberal counter revolution, you know. Oh. Um, so so look, there are precedents, and I think in some ways. Um, I mean, the editorial I've just had, sorry, a bit of a plug for myself here, but, um, <laughs> yeah. in, in the attachment journal about, about ACEs, um, adverse childhood experiences, says, look, in some ways we, we are, I think, post-COVID, post or as we come out of COVID, we may be able to, to recover some of what happened after the Second World War, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when people said, no, we're not going back to the austerity of, of the 1930s, we're not going back to that sort of... Um, upper class command uh, culture you know we've had a people's war and the people are going to get their, their due rewards mm. um, so and and it was a there was an opportunity at the end of the war to radically alter um British educational system including mm. the the private boarding school system and um because he'd been to uh, a boarding school you know sort of rather funked it um but, you know, we're, we're sometimes history sort of has to come round again, you know, to to get the full import. Um, mm. I hope it's not just wishful thinking. But. No, no, I'm yeah. I'm definitely there to do what I can do to to start changing this. I feel it it has to change. Yeah. You know, I, I loved what, and I've, I've said shared this before in a podcast. This idea that. Um, I think it's Peter Levine talks about it in his book about healing trauma might be in um, awakening the, the tiger within yeah. him saying that when we uh, are traumatized as a child. So if someone hits us, then it, as an adult, we're likely to hit someone else it's yeah. Like, yeah. unless we deal with it. And I love what Joy Chevron says, you know, that boarding school is essentially a prison. And this idea that we're captivity, the ABC she talks about. And therefore, I wonder that what's been going on over the last few years with all these restrictions is how much of that is because of the trauma of this, you know, this ruling, the, the people who are in charge who have not dealt with their trauma. And therefore, those restrictions. So I do feel that something needs to change on so many levels. Yeah. We definitely, yeah. Um, the, the the problem really is that um, uh, where the prison analogy breaks down a bit, I think, and where, where it's very problematic, mm. is you have people willingly sending their children off to prison. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's the paradox. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that requires, I think, a sort of different level of reflection to to actually mm. question that. Um, but, uh, that is one of the questions I've got further down. Is why, oh, right. why are people, go there. <laughs> why are people doing that? Why are people sending their children to prison? 
Well, it's 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 part of the sort of enculturation process we were talking about earlier on. You know, if 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 you're if you're, I mean, you know, and to some extent, we, we were both uh, victims of it because we came we came from families which had a previous generation that went to boarding school. Uh, in my in my um, my mother's side, there was you know her her father went to Eton. It doesn't go back further than that. If you talk to Alex Renton, it goes back 12 generations on his mother's side, you know. Wow. So uh, some of us are kind of quite, quite late to this. Um, but it, it gets passed on in terms of, 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 the, of um, the done thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And to some extent, we all live in, 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 the, in the culture we inhabit, rather like the fish in, in their sea, you know. We, we can't... Uh, examine everything we do every day as, as to whether it's appropriate or works or not. So there are, there are always some assumptions in our culture. Um, unfortunately, some of those assumptions are, are very damaging. Mm-hmm. And, um, and maybe historically, we have to say, look, this, this institution did, did serve a role, you know, in a, in a specific historical context. But it's no longer serving uh, a good purpose. And the interesting thing I've thought about recently is if you go back even further, before the boarding school, before the public, before the public schools were captured by the aristocracy, they really were public schools. They were mm-hmm. set up to, desert, to, to serve the less well-off in a locality. They weren't, they weren't set up to uh, educate the children from hundreds of miles away or even the other side of the world in the empire. So I, mean, I thought maybe we should maybe we should say, look, let's let's go back to the original function. Mm. A bit like saying, let's go back to what originally was real public service. Mm. So uh, I think I think there's quite a case for um, articulating change in terms of retrieving good, good traditions from the past. And um, yeah, I mean, okay, let's take the word public seriously in public school. Make it public again. That's why I've made the link to Denmark, you know, and the uh, and the after school and the after schools in Denmark, because they are they are public boarding schools, you know, with completely different purposes to ours. So I, I think in some ways, you know, one, one, one can almost call these people out and say, look, uh, you know, if, you, if you're really into public service, if you're really into serving, serving ordinary people, these schools, some of these schools, I don't think all of them can survive. There's probably too many of them in certain places. Mm-hmm. But um yeah, let, let's 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 return them to their original purpose, and and an actual fact, let's put, put people back into families. That's what I do at the end of the upper class complex trauma condition paper. Mm. I say, look, you know, um, yeah, uh, young kids should be in local schools, mixing with uh, everybody. You know, mm. it would be good for the local community, and it would it would be good. Um, it would be good for the families. It would be good all round. You know, what's going on here? You've, you've, you've developed this dysfunctional system, which, which really grew up in the middle of the 19th century to service the, the empire. Well, the, em- yeah, the empire's gone. Let's, let's, let's move on. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, fascinating. Thank you. Um, I've got what other questions have I got? Um, so I think we've talked about that. Um, So I guess the questions are to do with, you know, you've spoken a little bit First Nations. Um, so another, so it was the idea of happy to unpick the difference between the upper class complex um, trauma condition and boarding school syndrome with the First Nations. Um, and you mentioned about the social context is important. So would you be able to unpick the difference between those those two? Um, well, um, this might help a bit, as I don't know. I, I think there are, there are two rather um, similar but different ideas. One is enculturation, mm-hmm. which means, in actual fact, you know, culture reproducing itself um, from from a consensual viewpoint, mm-hmm. which is what I would say the upper class are doing when they send their children to boarding school, you know, it's yeah. part of their, that system. Yeah. If you are a First Nations child, or maybe if you don't come from an upper class background and 
just for example, you know, you, you, you have ambitious uh, new money parents who want to turn you into a, what they imagine is, is a very successful person. Then you are subjected to a process of acculturation, which is enforced turning into, you know, which means probably losing your accent, being removed from your geographical locus, uh, being removed from your family, more or less permanently in the case of First Nations, um, being uh, uh, removed from your uh, spiritual traditions. So I, th I think that is to some extent helpful um, that there's uh, enculturation is, is a kind of consensual process and acculturation is enforced. Um, so that, that, in my view, is the difference. Now, uh, I think that the, the disagreement in Canada between um, the early uh, people who identified the uh, iniquities of the residential schools and Charles Brasfield, who was a psychiatrist who worked with victims of residential schools, was, um, I think their worry was, if we made the schools nicer, it's all right. Uh, whereas the kind of more radical um, indigenous people would say, no, look, you know, whatever you do with them, they're wrong. You know, they're, they're forcing people into, into a way of life they don't want to lead. Now, I, look, Charles Brasfield was, a, as far as I can tell, a very humane psychiatrist who was trying to pick up the pieces of people who'd been uh, really ruined in residential schools. A bit like boarding school survivors here, you know, if you go to a psychotherapist and somebody's in your consulting room and in pieces, you don't give them a lecture on the history of boarding schools, you know, or colonialism. <laughs> you try and, you try and uh, uh, mitigate what's going on in front of you, you know, so it's a bit that sort of distinction. But if you step back a bit further, I think you have to sort of say, look, we, we, need, we need a different approach to culture. We need a different approach to pedagogy, you know. And uh, it may have been justifiable in the mid 19th century, but you know, come on, it's not justifiable now. Mm. Um, mm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of a bit like um, uh, the Black Lives Matter thing. I mean, I don't know if you saw David Olushoga's program last night on the on the NHS. Well, it's it's no. well worth a visit. I mean, he's he's a brilliant um, uh, mixed uh, mixed race um, um, historian, um, and he he did this um, examination of the NHS post war, you know, and going into the archives, and um, it, it was it was just incredibly moving, Piers, because it. it, it, it <laughs> Came so obvious there would be no NHS without overseas nurses and doctors. It would not exist. Mm. It's the most international organization institution we have. And yet you had these stories of people devoting their lives to looking after, in quotes, a lot of white people, um, you know, who'd been ignored and um, put down and uh, diminished, you know. I mean, I was in tears at the end because it was just it was so moving. Um, I thought, yeah, I mean, he's 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 at the forefront of kind of moving things forward. Uh, he's a brilliant, he's a brilliant guy. I don't know if you've seen any of his stuff. No, um, is really he an ex, is he's, he an ex border? I mean, I've, I've heard of someone no, who went no, to I, Eton. No, he's I don't think he's an ex. I think you're getting him muddled up with uh, Musa Okonga. Ok Ok okay. went to Eton. That's it. No, I, I'm. I'm he may have gone to a grammar school. But he's, he's he's actually he's um, he's half English and and, and half uh, Nigerian, I think. Um, okay. So he, he's he, he's he's very very bright. He's very measured measured, and he's he's angry, but his anger is focused and, and under control. And I think that's also another thing we 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 ex borders political survivors have to grapple with is is you know harnessing the rage and, mm. and the abandonment and in, in, in a kind of way which, which which can be used positively you know yeah 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 it takes a while i mean you know i, I think we're all on different, different stages in this, in this year. Mm. yeah i loved what uh, christine jack talks about in her book 
this idea that it's an ongoing process. Sometimes it's almost like we feel like, yep, I'm done, all sorted. But actually, uh, I I I, th- I think we borrowed something from the from the twelve step movement. You know, um, mm. myself. You know, I'm I'm a complex PTSD in recovery. Okay. Yeah. 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 Huh? I'm seventy four. It's, it's it's you know I, I guess it's, there's too much water under the bridge, dears. You know. Mm. Yeah. 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 Well. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Look, look, on the other hand, I'm not. If if somebody wants to say, yeah, I've, I've got it all sorted, that's all right as well. But I, I, I can't say it for myself, you know. No, I can't either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think I often hear that from people. So I'd love to maybe just finish on that. The idea that sometimes, as ex-boarders, this normalisation is sometimes we do compare ourselves with someone. Even at school, you know, when I left school, it was like, well, I had it easy. And then as I started to unpack it, it was like, well, actually, there was still a lot of trauma there that I needed just to process. So I'd be interested in just hearing, you know, how maybe that's worked for you, like that allowing yourself just to maybe grieve for where you were at or... um, I don't know if that makes sense. Just this idea of... um, I do apologize. One of my post boarding school things is I lose my train of thought. So this is something I, maybe that's my dissociation uh, thing, but yeah. All right. I think, I think, I think I've got bits of my memory missing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I think I'm just uh, fascinated by that, that, um, cause I think that was something, a big healing for me just, and I think it was one of the Buddhist monks I lived with who just said, just receive yourself as you are peers. And I, you know, so. I think, look, I think this come, I mean, this comes up very kind of, um, uh, how can I put it? Um, it it's very much in the foreground in, in Alex Renton's latest book. And and because he's confronting his own family's implications in slavery, it's there in my family to ex- to some extent, and I haven't fully researched it, so I don't quite know to what extent. In that, um, my French family in Bengal got involved in two extractive industries. One was indigo, and the other was mica. And from what I've read, they weren't very pleasant industries to uh, to be uh, exploiting so I think there is a place for guilt but I don't I don't know about the details of, of, of your family's background um, you know whether whether you you benefit fr- from riches amassed um, in ways which we, we would find today except unacceptable mm. um, that's that's something for you and your histories but I do think there are times when guilt is appropriate and has to be acknowledged. Um, but again, it, it depends really from, from where you're coming. Um, I, I think I've, I've been lucky in that I've, I've always had access to some money, not, not, you know, not, uh, not fortunes, but I've never felt that I'm gonna go hungry, Piers. Um, I've led a, fa- led a fairly limited life, partly because of my the anxieties I carry around, and partly because I've, I've, you know, uh, lived off a sort of rather limited income. <clears throat> um, but I, so, I do sometimes think, yes, um, if I hadn't had the money, I, I could have ended up in the gutter as an addict. You know, I mean, I think, I think that's that's a that would certainly have been a possibility. I mean, something much worse could have happened to me. Mm-hmm. Not uh, because I, I could have found no other way of self-soothing the, the, the awful anguish I was I was going through internally. You know. Um, look, I, I I grieve because I think I could have had yeah a much a much more pleasant 
childhood, although, it, you know, growing up on a farm had its, had its fantastic benefits. So, uh, and I love the countryside. I mean, one of my kind of um, go-tos for, uh, you know, soothing is nature. You know, um, I, I, I've got a little garden here in London, uh, which, which kept me going during the lockdown. I find it difficult to live without without a patch of green, you know. And I'm near Hampstead Heath and one or two other places. Um, yeah, I, I wish I hadn't had to negotiate such a complicated background, you know, partly the hidden colonial background, which literally only in the last sort of eighteen months have I got got to grips with. Um, I wish my parents had been a bit more self confident. Uh, yeah, my, my dad also, my, my dad wasn't violent towards me. In a way, he was too docile, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't lead me into the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you had a different sort of thing to, to deal with. But maybe the issue expressed itself in a different way, but was also um, uh, debilitating in lots of ways. So, um, yeah, I, I uh, you know, when you get to my age, you, you kind of think, yeah, there's, there, there are quite a few regrets. Um, it could have turned out turned out better. It could have turned out quite a lot worse, you know. Um, and uh, I mean, I did actually manage. I mean, you know, I can't go into this now, but um, mm. just by chance, my, my father's plane was found at the bottom of a Norwegian lake and is now in the in the Fleet Air Arm Museum, mm. and. Uh, through that connection, I managed to reconstruct a lot of his his wartime career and his his naval career. And I found he was a much respected naval officer. You know, um, I met up with the um, the man who armed his plane on the aircraft carrier, who who had actually become a successful publican. And I went to meet him, um, and. Uh, he opened the door to quite a smart suburban house near Birmingham. And he took one look at me and said, gosh, you don't look like your father. I said, <laughs> I tried not to say. I said, well, I took, look after my mother's side of the family. But then he told me the most touching story about my dad. You know, I had a few photographs and he had a few as well. And he said, uh, he said, you know, Simon, he was the only officer who, come, who could come below deck thank the men for keeping the planes in the air mm. so you know i'm sort of cheering up saying that it was a you know good sighting mm. Mm. i think in some ways my father was uh well he'd only been one generation boarding my mother you know, my mother had all that in her family i think you know he, he I would say he was a bit more in touch with his feelings than my mother, actually. I had to, had to make a, a judgment call. Mm. So, uh, mm. thank you for yeah. sharing the story. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. About it, it. Yeah, yeah. I think we're about an, coming up for an hour and a half. So, I guess the last question, just drawing this all together, how do people get in touch? Where do we go from here? um you know access to maybe your articles um i'm happy to put links in the bottom of the description um, um some yeah of that's them. that's very kind of you um i think there's there's two things i'd like to say one is that um i think the initiative which the um private education policy forum have taken in publishing my piece um does signal to me that they're finally taking the boarding school issue seriously. Mm. And they have said to me they're going to organise an event focusing exactly on this. Uh, like everything, you know, subject to what happened with COVID and, and how things mm. unfold. So I, I think if you could put the link to the article, that, that would be helpful. Mm. Um, mm. I don't have a website because... I don't feel I could keep up with the website. You know? <laughs> yeah. Talk about memory. I mean, I, I'm limited to what, to how much information I can take in and process and, and, and handle. And 
alongside the London Aces uh, hub, which, which I would also like you to put a name cut to. Mm, sure, uh, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm fairly much at full stretch, and I, I want. There are things on my bucket list, years, you know, which I, which I need to, I need to do. Partly, uh, one of them is going back to India, hopefully, mm. um, which I've never been to. Um, put my email address, mm. and if people want to. What I might do actually is send you a list of my published articles. Mm, that would be great. Um, which maybe could be on your website, mm. and then people could look through it and say, "Yeah, this looks interesting. That looks interesting." And then if they if they emailed me, I'm I'm happy just to you know attach a PDF. So um, that's that's really the, the best I can. I can Pierce, I think. Um, oh, well, that sounds great. Thank yeah. you for, yeah. Yeah. thank you for your time today, your wisdom, and your insights into boarding well, school. And, uh, thank yeah. you for providing um, a transitional space. We, we we need more of these, and and and, and mm. you're doing you're doing some great work. So um, I think we're we're we're, we're on complementary roads. Um, and yes. um, you know, I think I think these things are are coming together in a in a kind of um, helpful way. Yeah, yeah, yes, I, I really see that as well. I think, like you say, the idea that boarding school syndrome, boarding school survivors are vanguard of change. I think that's really, really beautiful. Um, it, it could be, the, you know. I, look, I think some people are so. I. I, I I think what I do recognise is that some people are just getting in touch with their awful pain, you know, mm. and you can see this on the forum, you know, if somebody sort of says, you know, if they've had the kind of revelatory moment, I just, you know, I mean, I'd probably say, ah, oh, I can see, you know, but people, people, I think in that, in that, in that process, you know, they've, they've just got to sort themselves out. Mm. I think people a bit further down the line, uh, I think it's our our duty to engage, mm -hmm. and one of my critiques a bit of the, of, of, of the um, boarding school situation is this: there hasn't been enough encouragement once, once you've got past. Mm -hmm. and, and look, some people just may just may feel it's too much. I'm not I'm not sort of saying everybody has to do this, but I do think that part of the part of the recovery is actually engaging in a in a, in a wider process of, of change and. Um, I mean, I learned that lesson from Judith, Judith Lewis Herman, mm. her mother's book, Trauma and Recovery. Um, and she's, she says somewhere in the book, nobody recovers from trauma on their own, because one of the, one of the aspects of trauma is, 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 this, is this shaming aspect where you turn away, you look down. And in actual fact, engagement at a certain point, I think is part of the recovery process. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've written a book about my boarding school experiences and hopefully it's taken me almost a year and a half. And yeah, I felt a lot of shame of just put it publishing it because very few people. Uh, it's it's been up. published, has it? Not yet. No, okay. no, no, no. I was just I was just wondering whether I've no, no I missed, it's, missed, it's, missed your book <laughs> it's still on the floor down there and i've been going through and i think i've done seven or eight edits yeah um but I, it's that partly that shame right. um, well, as a writer i can say to you that it's, you, you never at some point you have to let go of it because this yeah. <laughs> you can always um luckily if you're writing an article there tends to be a deadline so you have to you know at some point you have to send it off to the editor mm -hmm. you self-publishing or what I, no, I don't think I'll be able to because I'm talking about some very um, uh, difficult subjects about what went on at my school. I feel I need to go through a publisher because I need the legal side of things to look through it because um, I might upset quite a few people, I, I sense. But yeah, well, like, I, I'm, 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 you're going to upset people. The thing is, you know, not to get into legal deep water. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think I think the upset goes with the goes with the project. But, um, 
Uh, well, look, I, I just wish you um, all, all the best with it. Really. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your support. It's great having people out there like yourself doing this work yeah. and doing this research and, and leading that edge of well, what's yeah. next, what's next. Uh, so thank you. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I really it's appreciate all, it's that. It's all adding to the, the momentum, I think. It is, it is. And if I can support you in any way, then please do let me know. Yes, it's been it's been a pleasure talking to you. And um, yeah, so uh, just just uh, stay well, wish you well. And uh, we will, well, let's hope, I mean, the other thing I hope is that, you know, we, we can, um, some of us survivors and campaigners can, can meet up in a public forum before too long. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe at the, private education policy forum, it may be it's something which um, calling, calling sort of survivors campaign organizers, but you know, we have been rather uh, lacking in those sorts of face-to-face. Uh, mm. -face, um, that would be great. Engagement. So that, that would be great. Mm. Well, thank you, Simon. So I'm going to let you go. So thank you very much, Simon. Take care. See you later. Bye-bye. Sure.